<laughs> Hi everyone, to people watching on live stream. <laughs> and thousands of home all the way back to Hawaii. Uh, the fifth season of digitalism is starting tonight. Uh, when I recall back four years, and it was a really stormy night, storm of epic proportions, and we were like calling every single friend and relative we have and asking them, please, could you come to the inaugural digitalism event? At that time, we didn't have a clue what will happen. It will, might last like two events, three events, five or whatever. So tonight we are into fifth season and this is like third English speaking event so far. So it's number 37. And it's all thanks to our dear sponsor and friends from Trebiesen, Nikšić Kopivo. And tonight's speaker told me that, look, man, uh, I've spoken in more than 12 countries all over the world. But this is the first time my tweet was retweeted by a beer company. So what's up? And I told him that our friends from Trebis are that cool. It might also do something with the fact that he's also a really, really cool guy. And, and the shirt he was wearing on the photo is also like a typical Hawaiian shirt. So maybe the retweet was because of the shirt. Uh, thanks all for coming. Uh, the hashtag we'll be using is the same one we use always, it's Digitalizume. So if you're in the room or you're watching the live tweet, you can, uh, uh, live stream, sorry, you can either live tweet or pose questions using the hashtag Digitalizume. And I'll be collecting all the questions, so once our speaker is done, I'll be asking the questions. And you can also ask the questions yourself once we're done. So without further ado, our speaker for today comes from the U.S precisely from Hawaii. He's a researcher at the University of Hawaii. He's also a consultant. He's been doing his research and consultancy in more than 12 countries all over the world. And he's trying to mix and successfully mixing like two things that personally I couldn't figure out how. So the first one is strategic planning. I've been doing that thing for like last 12 years and it's Students say it's arguably the most boring thing ever. But on the, other on the other hand, he's doing games, which students usually beg me to do and said, okay, we don't need to do anything, just let us play games. So this guy here is trying to mix it up and try and use strategic planning and serious games. So first, what is a futurist? What are serious games? What is strategic planning and using serious games? So give it up for our speaker of, of the night, John Sweeney. Thank you so much for coming out. It's definitely an honor for me to be here. When I met with Vladimir and he told me that this is the fifth season, uh, I thought that's, that's horrible. Uh, that's a lot of pressure on me and that this is only the third English speaking event. Uh, I apologize. The only thing worse than my English is my Montenegrin. So I uh, won't be able to do Montenegrin, but I can do Valapuno. So thank you again for coming out. Uh, I wanted to start by talking a little bit about my work as a futurist and then talk more about games. But if you feel already like you want to go, then this slide basically encapsulates the entire presentation. So I can turn my head and you can sneak out if you want. This essentially is what my work is. And uh, as Vladimir mentioned, right now, and last year and a half, uh, I've done about six, maybe six and a half games, uh, serious games with different clients, mostly governments and agencies like the UN. And that's because uh, of this quote, I think you can discover more about a person in an hour of play than a year of conversation. There's a question mark after play though, because many people think you didn't actually say it. But essentially for me, games are a research tool. And if you've been keeping up with serious games, obviously there's lots of research showing as a tool for stakeholder engagement, for citizen wisdom and insight, to try to actually change conversations and then hopefully change the outputs of those conversations, games are really cool. And if you didn't pick up on it uh, when we started, uh, I was a gamer geek growing up. Uh, I gave up on video games when the controllers got too complex, but I always loved board games. And Risk was one of my favorite games. It's world domination, so how can you not love Risk? Uh, but I wanted to point out the difference between a game and a serious game. So I loved playing Risk, and it was a great game. And it's all about different countries and, and moving troops and controlling resources. But I didn't learn anything about contemporary geopolitics by playing Risk, right? 
So a serious game is very different from a regular game. You might use gaming dynamics. You might have cards, you might have players, you might have tokens, you might have things you move around, right? Uh, interactions that are staged, certain uh, constraints, things you can't do. Uh, but ultimately, a serious game obviously is about some kind of real world thing. It's meant to have some particular kind of impact. And for me, that's, that's really important. Otherwise, well, we're just playing games, but okay, there's nothing really wrong with that. And then what is my job as a, as a futurist, as a foresight consultant? Well, the first part of this quote is really important. Uh, I'm no prophet. I'm not here to tell you how the future is going to be. Uh, later, if you want to pay me, I can lie to you, but I probably won't be telling you honestly how the future really is. You really don't pay me. Um, my job really is about making windows where there are walls. So I want people to see things that they can see normally. I want to expand how people think about things and my job is to take something that someone maybe thinks is impossible and maybe say, well, it's actually improbable or maybe implausible. Uh, impossible is not really a word that we use. So the idea is we want to always try to keep an option open. And that's why very maybe awkwardly, whenever we talk about the future, it always has an S. Because the future for us is always a plural space. The future for us is more about being a verb than a noun. It's an active space where things happen. Um, but it's not a free-for-all. It's also a place where, obviously, certain people have more power than others. So I thought it'd be interesting to start by trying to get a sense as to how you understand and view the future. I imagine for some of you, that's the metaphor for thinking about the future or how you feel about the future is that it's a roller coaster. And you're strapped in, and you're along for the ride. And you know the first part of the roller coaster is the tick, 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 boom, and then you're off, right? But maybe you feel like the roller coaster is more like kayaking down a river. You get in, there's a flow to things, but you have your paddle, you can pull off, you can even go against the current if you want, but that's gonna be a lot of work. Or maybe you feel like the future is you're sailing on the sea. You have a crew, you have your ship, you chart your course, you know where you wanna go. There are gonna be storms, there's gonna be wind, right? There's gonna be all sorts of stuff, but it's up to you where you go. Or maybe you think the future is like rolling dice in a game of chance. You can bet on a particular number, but at any given time, you never know what's going to come back. So let's do a quick poll. How many of you are roller coasters? Anybody? How many of you are roller coasters, but you don't want to admit it? OK, all right, we'll go on to the next one. Uh, kayaking down a river? River people? OK, yeah. Sailing on the sea? Sea? And rolling dice in a game of chance? Yeah. Is it a 12-sided die? Uh -huh. Gamers. Okay. Uh, what is this whole thing about? Well, ultimately, this is one of the tools we would use. It's like an icebreaker exercise to understand how we make sense of the future. And ultimately, our perceptions about the future have an impact on how we act. Therefore, they actually have an impact on how the future ends up being. So if you're over in roller coaster land, you clearly think you don't have a lot of power in the future. The future is a pretty decided place. Unless you built that roller coaster, and that would be very impressive if you did. You're on someone else's ride, and you're strapped in. And there are going to be screams, there might be some laughs, but you're not really in control. A little bit further along the way, if you're rolling dice, then who knows what's going to happen. The future is all about uncertainty. So how can you predict anything? Things are just kind of out in the open. It turns out most people in the world, and I say in the world because I've done this in uh, all the countries that I've worked in, other colleagues use this as well. Uh, most people are here. Most people fit into this. But the real answer is, it obviously depends on when and how you get asked. So tomorrow, you might be a roller coaster, and then two days later, you might be a dice. But the whole point is, if you're working together with people, if you're trying to understand and do a project, it's one of the helpful ways, just as a little icebreaker, uh, of how we try to make sense of the future. So where did I learn that? What's this whole thing about futures? Well, there's actually a discipline called future studies. You can actually get a degree in this stuff, and I was just as surprised as you are to find out about that. Uh, maybe some of you know that already. Maybe some of you uh, have and or want to get degrees in future studies. So uh, five years ago, I started my PhD at the Hawaii Research Center for Future Studies, uh, otherwise known as the Manoa School. Uh, we use this imagery because we kind of think of ourselves like a gang. This is the uh, former director of the center who was there for 40 years. He just retired last year. You see we always have futures. Uh, you obviously, some of you recognize this image because it's a play on this image, right? The famous Shepherd Ferry Obey probably the most recognizable artistic, certainly recognizable street art image in the world. Does anyone know the backstory of this image? Really fascinating story. Uh, the story is told in this film, Execute the Gift Shop, which is a documentary about Banksy and about street art. 
And here's the story goes. Shepard Ferry was just a poor art school student in the 1980s, and he wanted to do a social experiment. And his social experiment was, how do people understand how something has value or power? So here's what he did. He made this image, and this is uh, Andre the Giant from the World Wrestling Federation, who I you know, grew up watching. And he had Obey on here, and it said, Obey Giant or Andre the Giant has a posse. And the truth is, this image has no meaning whatsoever. Truth is, a lot of art is the same. No, I shouldn't say that. Um, so he decided, okay, I'm going to put this image everywhere. And if I put it everywhere, people will see it. And the more people see it, the more they think it means something. So his whole point was, he's going to create real power through perceived power. Which is to say, this image means absolutely nothing. But if every city you go to, you see it, you're like, okay, there must be something going on with this image. Well, we think the future works the same way. Because we perceive certain futures to be everywhere, and certainly if you look around now, what are the most popular images of the future? Death, destruction, dystopia. I mean, we live in a pretty crazy world, so I think ultimately our images of the future are reflective about our perceptions of the future. And this is why we always have futures, and this is why I didn't make this image. Uh, some colleagues put that image together. So what is a lot of my work in Foresight? Uh, a lot of it actually is encapsulated in a phrase called uh, surfing tsunamis. There's lots of things we can't control in life, but we certainly think we can try to make people more resilient, more agile. Uh, we don't talk about risk management. We talk about navigating uncertainty. So the whole idea is, look, if a tsunami's coming, great, go get your surfboard. I'm, I'm a really surfer, so I wouldn't want to be in that situation. Uh, but the idea is, yeah, we have big challenges, but we're a pretty resilient species. Maybe we can work it out. And how do we do that? Well, we create different images from different futures. So I did a project in uh, Burma for the last three years. We wanted to show the Burmese people what happens if development continues. So by 2023, maybe parts of Burma look a lot more like uh, Manhattan than they did you know, uh, 20, 30 years ago. Or if climate change keeps going really, really uh, intensely, maybe by 2060, uh, the entire uh, Maldives is underwater. So they have uh, you know, giant hotels, the same thing here. Uh, this one, unfortunately, seems to have come true uh, about drones and China and development and everything. It's a little bit scary. I won't get too much into that. And so the kind of projects we do uh, as consultants typically involve helping, again, agencies enhance their planning process. Uh, as Vladimir mentioned, uh, the whole idea of strategic planning has been around for a long time. We're not trying to replace that. We're trying to make it better. So I've been really fortunate to be affiliated with one of the oldest research centers, but now I'm working with one of the newest and the Center for Post-Normal Policy and Future Studies, it sounds like a really big mouthful. Um, we're framed around this whole idea of this guy, Zia Sardar. We want to decolonize the future. So everyone in this room, very clearly, has some power to act on the future. But for all of us, myself included, we're not as powerful as Google. We're not as powerful as a government of X country or Y country. So how do we make sure that citizens or people have an equal voice? Well, the first thing we have to recognize is we live in the future. Uh, and certainly we live in this sort of post, uh, you know, back to the future future. But the idea is the imaginings that governments have or all these reports about projections, we live and deal with these futures because when a government or an agency decides they want to do something, what do they do? They make a five-year plan, a 13, 15, X number year plan. Uh, but also agencies like the World Bank, IMF, have these longer term projections. And then what happens? They invest money according to those projections. So the question is, are they not just predicting those futures, or are they actually making them by responding to the actual projections, right? So we're living in other people's futures precisely because they imagine certain kinds of futures, and oftentimes it's pretty linear. Uh, so a lot of our work is not just looking forward, but looking back, because very clearly, and I assume everyone in this room is walking around with what used to be a supercomputer uh, in their pocket, and sometimes it's really easy to forget that, but the kinds of changes that we've all lived through are extraordinary. And it's not to say these changes aren't just happening in, in technological spheres, but they're having all sorts of social impacts as well. So how we understand the world, our place in it. Um, and again, it's not just about new things all the time, but sometimes old things that never go away. So we've always used technology to do weird stuff, and maybe we've always been narcissists, but the whole idea is uh, it seems to affect 
politics, economics, uh, everything about life and how we make sense of it uh, is dominated by either novelty or continuity or uh, cycles of change. Now, what does that mean for the future and, and what do we think might happen? Uh, Bertrand, Bertrand de Juvenel is a famous French futurist and he said, well, more and more, it seems that we feel about the future like we're planning a trip and we're a tourist and we have a guidebook that's out of date. Uh, maybe you've had this experience, I have, but you get wrong directions from Google and it's the most frustrating thing in the world. Uh, and if you ever go into a used bookstore, one of the largest sections is the travel and what do they have? All of the old travel books. Because why would anyone buy an old travel book? But this for me is a metaphor about most, not all, strategic planning. Most strategic planning plans for a future that may not ever exist or maybe a future that's already passed. And that's because when you plan, you have to use data, you have to model, you have to create a possible future and potentially plan to it. But that only provides a limited view, right? So if this is us looking to the future, you have a little bit of light shining forward. Now, there are lots of additional planning processes that do public consultations and additional research to try to widen the scope a little bit. Uh, and that's good, because that gives you different voices. So what is foresight attempting to do? Well, foresight puts on the high beams. We want to see as much as possible, and ultimately we're looking for blind spots. So what are we not paying attention to? What are we not seeing? Uh, what are we missing completely? This has a long history, and I've been working uh, with the Ministry of Defense in the UK. Uh, the idea of red teaming, have one group whose job it is to make everyone else fail. And the idea is, again, that's really helpful because then you know, chances are you're going to miss something. Uh, not just things we don't know, but critical uncertainties. So sometimes it's what we don't even know that we don't know is actually the worst possible thing. Uncommon opportunities, things that maybe seem counterintuitive, working with some group or a new kind of partnership or doing something that maybe is a little bit uh, sort of scary, maybe can actually produce good results. And then finally, and this is at the heart of what we do uh, in Foresight, is looking at emerging issues. So not trends, not things that we know are happening, but things that maybe aren't quite a trend yet that could be a huge issue in the future. And I'll give you some examples. And why do we do that? Well, we want to surface and challenge our assumptions, but also produce more robust insights. So here's a clear example. Uh, a couple years ago, there was this huge volcano in Iceland that has a completely impronounceable name. 20 countries got affected, 10 million people got stranded all across Europe, right? Uh, I asked, I've already asked people here, people in Mont Montenegro's air travel wasn't affected, except what? If you were leaving Montenegro and going to Western Europe, oh, you were? Affected. We were affected? Where were you? In London. Oh, yeah, you were screwed. You were totally screwed. Yeah. Um, okay, so aside from Maria, if anyone else was affected, I'm really sorry, and that was probably really horrible for you. Uh, but imagine if you were in the international shipping business. If you're UPS or you're FedEx or your DHL, what happens? Overnight, your entire business model doesn't make sense anymore. Well, it turns out that one company had the foresight to create what are called scenarios for the future. And in one of their scenarios, they imagine not a volcano, but a pandemic, a disease outbreak. And that disease outbreak would spread across the world and it would cripple air travel in Europe. So what did they do? They designed a plan to use ground transportation and to use boats to somehow manage to survive. And it turns out when this volcano happened, they went, Oh, that's really, really horrible. Oh, wait. And they pulled the book off the shelf and they opened it up and they said, wow, we kind of have a plan that's not perfect, but we can use this, right? There are insights that we can use. So this is a good example for me because it shows they didn't predict the future. They didn't get it right, but they got enough of a good forecast to help them create insights that they can use. Uh, and again, this is a corporate example, and certainly corporations can be less bureaucratic than governments or different organizations, but it's just one example of the kinds of things you try to do with foresight. Now, if we look back into human history, we're not the best at the whole foresight thing. Uh, in fact, we're really good at ignoring the elephant in the room, the really obvious issues. Uh, and it turns out that we've known about climate change for a really long time. Uh, so sometimes it's really fun to look back at how stupid we've been. Uh, this is an advertisement from an oil company in the early 1970s, maybe, maybe 1967, but definitely early 70s at the latest. And in this advertisement, they are, they are uh, essentially gloating. It says, each day, Humble supplies enough energy to melt 7 million tons of glacier. 
There's no oil company today that would ever place that advertisement. That's the worst possible thing any oil company could ever say. In fact, Shell just said, we're not going to drill on the Arctic because, well, actually, they found it wasn't going to make them money. Uh, but the truth is, is now it's, there's so much of a social stigma about it, right? Uh, it turns out that actually the whole idea of carbon pollution, that's what it was called, it uh, came up in 1965. President Johnson in the U.S. was given a report that said carbon pollution is making the planet warmer. And they were like, well, what does that mean? I don't know. And then we waited 30 years later, and now finally we're kind of doing something about it, actually 50 years later. Uh, so what's the whole point of this? In foresight, the unthinkable, clearly the unthinkable, can become the unavoidable. So what we're attempting to do is to get people to think the unthinkable, to try to expand the thought and see what we can do. And that's because, as Buckminster Fuller said, we are really called to be architects of the future. Guess what this is? It's a customs form from the US government, so it's pretty horrible. Uh, this is what the astronauts had to fill out when they came back from space. So it says moon right here. Uh, because technically, they, they left the country, right? And technically, they had to come back into the country. So they had to sign this customs form, right? And disembarking, flight, all, everything is like NA, NA, right? Cargo. Sorry? Cargo. Cargo, yeah, the moon rock, moon dust, right? So what is this? This is stupid. But somebody somewhere in the huge bureaucracy of the U.S. government said, I think the astronauts should fill out a customs form, right? Why? Because we've always done that, right? So oftentimes, the reason things continue the way they are is because somebody somewhere whose job it is to say, well, we've always done it that way, so I guess we should always keep doing it that way, points that out, right? And you end up with these weird things that don't make any sense. So. I think that's a good example of the fact that we seem to live in a world increasingly that's post-normal. Uh, the whole idea of normal doesn't really make sense anymore, so we're beyond the whole concept of normal. Uh, and I'll tell you a few stories about why I think that's the case. Uh, I really like jellyfish. I, I mean, I don't like them. It's horrible when you live on an island surrounded by jellyfish and you want to go in the water, but jellyfish to me are a good example about how things can get really weird really quickly. In 1999, the president of the Philippines uh, went on TV after the power came back on to tell everyone in the country that everything was safe and the military had not taken over. And the reason he had to do that is because 40% of the country lost power and everyone thought that was it. New government, military, things were changing, right? It turns out that a major coal-fired power plant, which was on the coast, one of their intake valves got essentially filled up with jellyfish. Because jellyfish and certain, certain kinds, uh, especially moon jellyfish, do this weird thing called ballooning, where thousands of them will come into one place at one time, and actually scientists don't even know how or why they do it. Uh, and that causes all sorts of weird issues. Uh, the same thing happened in 2005. The USS Ronald Reagan, the largest naval warship in the world at the time, an aircraft carrier which has like 5,000 people on it. And look, as an American, I'm really sorry if the stupid US builds anything like that. Uh, it was forced to leave port in Australia, because it, and, this, and that ship actually has a nuclear intake it was forced to leave because of jellyfish as well. Uh, this has happened in Japan, Israel, <clears throat> India. All over the world, there are about 430 commercial nuclear reactors. We're building about 70 of them, say we, other people, are building 70 of them right now. Most of them are on major commercial waterways. Most of them are vulnerable to jellyfish. So it's kind of weird to think that if someone's having a bad day, or if a fuse blows out, or if the sensor doesn't go off, and a bunch of jellyfish start to show up, that things can get really, really weird. But that's the world we live in. So uh, obviously people are very concerned still about what happened in Japan with Fukushima, with the tsunami and the nuclear uh, event. And again, this to me is an example that things have gotten really weird. So a little bit closer to home. Uh, in the Northern Adriatic, a study was done by some Italian researchers and they found out that right now, jellyfish are having a negative impact on the economy uh, by about 8 million euros a year. So what's happening? Well, because of climate change, the ocean is getting warmer. It's getting more acidic. And that's the perfect environment for jellyfish. 
So when fishermen go out to catch, they're not catching fish. They're catching these huge jellyfish blooms. And so right now, oh, they're spending all this money to go out and catch fish, and they're not able to make their livelihood. Uh, so for me, this is a good example of the kinds of changes that are happening and things you maybe want to pay attention to. And then also, I just I found this when I was doing research uh, for this UN project we're doing here. The first giant jellyfish, it's almost a meter across, uh, was spotted in the Adriatic uh, just last year, and they haven't seen one there since World War II. So again, things are fundamentally changing, and ultimately, uh, I think it's because obviously we're having a major effect on the climate system, uh, but obviously then there are all sorts of unanswered questions here. So what do you do about this? How do you solve this kind of problem? Uh, well, in Korea, they're building jellyfish terminators. So these are autonomous sea drones that they'll put in the water, and they're tasked with seeking and destroying a jellyfish bloom. Now, that might seem like a really great idea, unless you're a small Korean child and you're swimming and you see this sea drone, right? So this to me is another example of we do things, there's always a cause and effect, but maybe we're not thinking things through. So Foresight is saying, all right, how do we get a little more conscious about what we want to do and why we want to do it? So if we take those ideas and we put that into the whole notion of games and the sort of work that I've been doing with uh, the UN, and I'll talk about the work we're doing with the UN here, uh, this is the bumper sticker version of, of what I've been doing. Uh, collaboration without foresight is dangerous. If you're going to work with a group or a team or work on a project, especially if it's going to go for a longer period of time, you should probably think about how you think about the future. You should have a sense as to what you all think the future is if you're going to work together. And then the other half of this is foresight without collaboration is pointless. Uh, so many decisions that affect the world that we live in now were made by people who closed the door and didn't let other voices in. So for me, it's really important that we try to give the public a voice as much as possible, that we do, uh, it's a really horrible term, stakeholder engagement, uh, but that we talk to people, real people, and see how they feel and how they think. Uh, and if you're familiar with the game, yes, I love Settlers of Catan. It's one of the best games of all time, and it's uh, essentially, well, I've, I've stolen lots of parts from it uh, to the games that I make. So maybe, Vladimir, what do you think? Do we want to pause there? And are there any questions about the foresight stuff? Or do we just roll on through? Just roll on through? OK, great. Uh, so uh, they wanted to share some of the work and games that I've had a chance to collaborate on with different people. Uh, and I will say as a caveat, if any of you are game designers, uh, I'm a really horrible game designer. I'm a game thief. So I find a game that I like or something that works, and then we try to use it and then we do it wrong, and then we fix it, and then we try to we do it wrong again, and then we try to fix it again. Uh, the first game we ever tried to do was a hybrid, mobile, augmented reality-driven, experiential foresight game. And if that sounds made up, it's because we totally made it up. Uh, we didn't know what we were doing, we just decided we wanted to do it. So how did it work? We created four different futures based on our research. We were in Hawaii, so we cut up the city. Four parts of Honolulu were four different futures. So if you were in that part of the city, you were living in that future. I mean, you didn't really know it because there were only 12 people playing the game. So we had this weird thing where people were just like living their lives and they walked into this future space and they had no idea what was going on. Uh, so for example, this was a, a friend's shop. Uh, it's like a coffee co-working space and we just took it over. And in this future scenario, there was this, uh, this guy who was running a court case and there were other people around and you could tell it's the future because he's wearing a weird hat, right? Um, and people were just coming and getting their coffee and watching this happen and they were pretty, pretty freaked out. But we used mobile augmented reality because we wanted people to experience the future as they went along. I'll talk about the drone in a second. So at the time, Honolulu had lots of really great street art. I say at the time because every year there's this meetup of street artists from around the world who go there and they tag all over the city. And so this is an example of their work. And so everyone is on their devices, not because this isn't great to look at, but because they're seeing this. So we took that street art and we layered it using augmented reality. So this is actually a memorial to the departed in the year 2062 by a group called the Cosmic Sufi Collective. And we did this for a bunch of stuff. And actually the website's still up there. You can see, uh, you can see some of the stuff. Uh, but ultimately, we thought that was a really interesting way to get people out of the present and into the future. So we just took over the city and made it into different futures. Uh, we actually wrote a book about it, and we then published it. 
And one of the things we wanted to do was to have people feel like they were actually making decisions that mattered. The whole study, and this was a actual, we got a grant to do this, it was a research study, was about how we use communication technology and how that affects the power that we have or the power we think we have. So in one of these futures, the world was dominated by drones and you could be living in Shanghai and controlling a drone in Pogoritza or vice versa. And ultimately, people made their living by controlling these drones. And it turned out in this one future, this person had stolen a bunch of information. Uh, and this is pre-Edward Snowden. And they were trying to sell it on the black market. And there was a tournament online for the person who could find them with the drone and kill them. And so eventually what happened was the person in this future had to decide, did they take the kill shot or not? And it turns out three out of four times they took the kill shot because they needed the money. So as a researcher, that was really interesting for us because we really wanted them to feel invested in the future and to try to understand it. Now, this is where serious games, I think, break from reality because uh, I know all four of those people. I'm not sure that as I know them now, they would have taken the kill shot. But again, you do things in games that maybe you don't do in real life, but it's all about the insights and the decisions. Uh, and then I throw in a gratuitous pick of Hawaii because, yeah, why not? Uh, oh, I will say, like, the coast here is pretty dope. I mean, you guys, you guys have a pretty good uh, Bay of Couture. Wow, pretty blown away. Uh, the next game that I did was uh, with a colleague in Singapore. Uh, the government of Singapore found out about our games uh, and they came to Hawaii and there was a conference and they asked us if we would work with them. Uh, and I'd done work in Singapore before and I thought, okay, sure, uh, we'll do some research and we'll see what we can do. So what was the game? Well, the game was first about crisis management, but then about longer term insight and planning. So the whole game, and it was a card game, was based on a really simple premise. Something happens and there's a public mood. And then different ministries do things, but what they do has a ripple effect, and then the public responds. And the whole point of the game was, does that raise or lower the public trust? Well, how do you determine that? Well, one person has to act as the public. And what we learned as is that's actually really cool and really horrible. It's really cool if you're playing the public, and it's really horrible if you're not playing the public, because everyone hates you if you're not the public. So the game was really interesting because it raised all sorts of questions about government citizen relationships. And then we had all sorts of events and blah, 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 blah. Uh, so this is what the game board looks like. And if it looks really complicated and horrible to play, it, it kind of was at first. Uh, we made it a little bit better. Uh, but the whole idea was this was going to be used as a training tool for new civil servants to help them think about how they could collaborate with different government ministries. So say, for example, you worked for the Ministry of Manpower, and that sounds weird, but in Singapore there actually is a Ministry of Manpower. Uh, you then would be forced not to be the Ministry of Manpower. You would be the Ministry of Education or the Ministry of whatever. So you had to play a different ministry to think about how they would work and how you might work with them. So in addition to thinking about the public relationship, it was also forcing you to collaborate with different, uh, different stakeholders. The next game we did uh, was with UNDP in Tonga, and I had no idea where Tonga was before I did this thing. It's a little small island nation in the South Pacific. Uh, it's a four hour flight from New Zealand, and New Zealand's pretty far away, so uh, it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. Uh, but it's ground central for climate change. Uh, Tonga is at the heart of all these issues about uh, having to try to subsist when everything they know about life is changing. So you can see, uh, this is where I stole stuff from Settlers of Catan, the hex cards. And this actually is very similar to the games uh, that I've done with other UN agencies and actually we're doing here now in uh, Montenegro. And this game was all about getting people together to help them think and talk about their preferred future. But we didn't let them define their preferred future fully. The government, and at the time UNDP, wanted to give them a little bit of a push. So rather than seeing themselves as a small island developing state, which is kind of the sort of UN speak for you're trying to get your stuff together, what if Tonga was a big ocean nation? So how do they reframe their story? And this goes back to the whole point about our images of the future help define our actions and perceptions about the future. So we had a room of 100 people. We had uh, seven game sessions. And this is what they came up with. Uh, in Tonga, the government is primarily run by the nobility. Tonga was never colonized, and it still has a king. The king has given over some power to the people, 
Uh, it, they're working on becoming a full parliamentary democracy. Right now, power is kind of shared. They do have a prime minister, uh, but they're, they're trying to get their act together. Now, it turns out that the nobility, the people that are, you know, uh, lady this and lord that, uh, they have four values that are highly associated with the nobility. And they're things like, it's almost like uh, you're reading uh, like an old you know, English novel about knights and chivalry and stuff like that. Uh, but it turns out most of the people who aren't nobles, I mean, no surprise, they hate that stuff. So when we were designing the game, we wanted to have a conversation about values. The last thing we wanted to do was to include the values of the nobility. So we came up with the idea, well, why don't we just have it a blank card? And if people write it in, they write it in. If they don't, they don't. And again, as a researcher, I was really fascinated by the fact that nobody wrote in the nobility values. We didn't give it to them, and they didn't say it in response. So again, this is where we're using a serious game to get some insight, to get some data. And so in the report to the government, and I had to go to the government two days later and say, guess what? Uh, most of the people at this event, like 87%, were commoners, and none of them wrote down the noble values. So you might want to think about what that means and actually, in the elections about three months after, uh, a new prime minister was elected and he wasn't a noble. So there were shifts that you could tell were happening, which means citizens had all kinds of insights and maybe no one was listening until it was too late. The next game we did uh, was about the Arctic and this was for an event in Iceland, the 2014 Arctic Circle Conference. About 3,000 people gather every year it's the biggest conference. Uh, it's actually sponsored by the Arctic Council, uh, which actually has, has non-binding power. Uh, but essentially, it's an organization, uh, a multilateral organization in different countries to try to understand and think about issues in the Arctic. And this game had a really basic premise. Again, how do we make sense of things that are happening in the future, challenges, opportunities, stakeholders, resources? But we wanted to push people not just to think about a future that might be likely, uh, that might be preferred, but to think about critical issues and how they work over time. So we have something here called the extended present, and that's in the next few years. Because what we found when we talked to everybody about the Arctic, they all said Russia. Russia, Russia, Russia. even the Russians we talked to said Russia. Uh, which means we actually had to design a game to get the obvious stuff out of the way first. So we did the obvious stuff, and then we moved to things that we expected, and then, as I mentioned before, the unthinkable, we use this notion of the unthought, which is another way of saying unthinkable, to get people to think critically about the future. And by the time they got up here, things were getting really weird. It was about how South America is going to try to take over the Arctic, because they're really upset that all the flooding and everyone's coming there. And so, yeah, so things get really, really wild. And we actually played this game with some people uh, who came to the conference. We got some really good feedback. Uh, I'm not going to be able to go this year. but. This year, because of how well it went last year, they're having a, quote, arcade at the conference. And so we're working with researchers at Columbia University uh, in the US, and they have games they've developed as well. So we're going to have this arcade stall, kind of in a, a room about this size, where people from the Arctic Circle Conference, and there's people like you know three-star generals that are walking around who might come in and play this game stuff. So uh, again, from my perspective, it's really interesting to think about how games can help change the conversation and hopefully produce insights. Gratuitous pick of Iceland, it's a pretty crazy place. Uh, the answer is no, I didn't see Bjork while I was there. I looked, but I totally didn't see her. Uh, okay, there's one more game and then we'll do yeah, Montenegro. Uh, last year, uh, actually last year, in the first part of this year, I was working with the European Commission. They came to us because they had a foresight study and the European Commission is, uh, they do really amazing work. They have about two dozen people whose job it is to think about the future, right? So they actually are really into it. Uh, but how can I say this nicely? Uh, it's like coat and tie foresight. It's like foresight for your parents. And some of you might be parents and don't take that personally, but uh, it's sort of like foresight made by adults for adults. Uh, it's just kind of lame, it's kind of boring. And uh, they realized that when they were giving it to other people to read, they, they weren't reading it. Uh, they produced a 50 page report, a 10 page report, and then a two page executive summary. And the feedback they got from everyone was they really liked the executive summary. Uh, and I agree, because why would anyone want to read all that stuff? So they thought, what if we took all of our stuff and we made it interesting? And so they got wind of the games we were doing, and so we made a game uh, helping them. This game was completely different from anything uh, we'd ever done before. This is a role-playing game 
uh, and this game works you through different kinds of futures. You have goals. Uh, this is probably the most game game of anything we've ever done. And so this was our prototype, and then this was three months later where we actually produced the game board. Uh, simple premise again, cards and tokens. You're working to the future. You can collaborate with people. Uh, you have these sort of time frames you work out to. And uh, this game actually has a winner. I didn't really mention it in the other games. Um, but the other games, isn't, it's sort of this weird thing, right? For like we're all winners, and maybe that's true. But uh, in this game, there's actually a winner. Whoever gets closest to their goal, whoever has the most points, that's, that's the actual winner. Uh, one more game. OK, and then we'll get to uh, Montenegro. So I mentioned I was working with the Ministry of Defense in the UK. Uh, their group that's responsible for producing the intelligence, both classified and unclassified, that then gets used right by the, the higher ups. So they have a foresight unit. And actually, they publish a really cool report. Now, I think it's 2045, Strategic Trends. It's, it's really interesting. Uh, they actually were really ahead of the curve in looking at things like blockchain, blockchain technology, so things like Bitcoin, uh, looking at new forms of financial transactions. And they came to us. and. I told Vladimir already. I realized I, I signed a paper saying I wouldn't show this, so like I don't, just don't I don't tell them. I guess I don't know. No, uh, it's yeah, yeah. It's being live streamed. It's being live streamed. Okay, great. So I'd like to apologize to the UK government. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I don't I don't think I'll get in trouble. But if you don't see me again, then yeah. Uh, and they're doing a study on Africa right now. So they have all this data and research on Africa. And the whole idea was again. So they want to look at economics. They want to look at infrastructure, information, natural systems, human systems. And we tried to get them to play with these ideas. Uh, I got in trouble last time because I tweeted a picture with people, and they said, don't do that, because they're analysts in the room, so I, I blocked out their eyes on this one. Uh, although I, I tell you his name, but uh, well, I'll tell you later. Um, so this, this is the kind of gaming session that they have. So why did they want to do a game? Well, actually, militaries have been doing games and simulations for a really long time, but they had a very specific problem. And their problem was this. When they get together, they have to have either a three or six people at a table. And I said, why? I said, well, if you're having a workshop, like just pick a random number. I said, no, 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 no. We have three branches of the military. So if we don't have either one or two from each of the table, everyone gets upset. And I was like, okay. So we made a six player game, right? Not a problem. And they said, but we have another problem. Uh, the problem is uh, Bob Sat. And I was like, I have no idea what that is. Uh, and Bob Sat is a bunch of blokes sitting at a table, uh, which means if there's a two star general at a table, and a bunch of people who have a lower level, they're not gonna talk, right? The general is always right, it turns out. So we created a game where, again, you have to role play as someone else, but everyone also has a fair turn. And that's really why we got interested in using games. Uh, many of you, I'm sure, have had the opportunity to go to different workshops, maybe even workshops sponsored by the UN. And as you've probably found out, just like an educational space, right? Workshops are basically like classrooms. Uh, some people talk more than others, right? Some people are more informed. Some people, to be honest, just won't shut up. So we use games because everybody has a turn. And then if you're not a very talkative person, but you want to make your voice heard, you want to make your argument heard, we use nonverbal cues, tokens. So tokens are actually just as valuable as the card that you're playing, and you can weight and prioritize things by using these tokens. So for us, it's about democratizing the conversation. We want everyone to have an equal voice. Now, that's a little bit utopian. I realize that that never is going to happen. But we think we're trying to level the playing field. So when we do projects like this, uh, you have to think about, again, if you're a game designer or you're a game geek uh, like me, um, this isn't the kind of game you'd go to the store and buy. But it's not meant to be. Uh, and maybe it's a little too serious, but we're trying to make them a little bit uh, better. So again, placing the tokens is all about making an argument, making a point. Uh, this is the, the last edition of the game. Uh, and this one, I probably not supposed to show it all. Uh, but this is the kind of work. So working towards the future. They then wanted to understand actions and making sense of them over time. So this is A to B to C. That's like a causal chain. And then write all sorts of weird impacts. Uh, I realize it's weird to look at. It doesn't make sense. But I'm not supposed to show it anyway. So uh, we'll just move on. OK, the last thing I've done, let's get some water because I'm starting to go pretty fast, uh, is uh, a game that we're doing here with UN Montenegro. And this is a really exciting project for me 
because this is really the culmination of the games that I've been doing recently, uh, and I get to work uh, in a place where I've been living uh, for about the last uh, 13 months. So we created a game system uh, called uh, Montenegro I Want, and we had two workshops called Hack to the Future, New Voices for UN Montenegro's Next Five-Year Plan. Look, I told you from the beginning, I just steal stuff, right, everywhere I possibly can. Not shy about it at all. Uh, and what are we trying to do? Well, every five years, every UN agency in every country where they're operating has to produce something called the UNDAF. And if you've ever worked for the UN or been to a UN event, you realize one thing about the UN, they love their acronyms. They totally love them. And if you're not involved, they don't make any sense to you, but I, I've learned a few of them. So the United Nations Development Assistance Framework is a strategic plan. It's a five-year plan. Uh, the government works with the uh, agency to produce it. All of the different groups uh, or agencies that are working in those countries, like UNDP, Development Program, UNICEF, the people that are concerned about kids, they all get together and say what they think is important. You produce priorities. This is what we're going to do. Now, what's really interesting about this is they produce something called the country analysis. And to be honest with you, I'd rather not talk about the country analysis because it's a huge project where one person is responsible for analyzing the entire country. It's this amazing process. And actually, I, I got a chance to edit it and work on it. And I learned a lot about the country. Uh, and it's a really interesting document. Um, and then they do strategic planning. And then they do monitoring and evaluation, right? So it's really simple, right? What's happening now? What do we think might happen or what do we want to have happen? And then let's make sure it happens. I mean, this is the heart of strategic planning. There's only one problem. Um, if you don't use foresight in part of the process, you miss things that are pretty big. So, for example, the next five-year plan, maybe are these dates, these dates are right, or did I, okay, yeah, uh, is going to start in 2017 and end in 2021. Now, chances are, pretty good chance, uh, Montenegro will fully ascend to the EU at that point, right? So, in other words, big things are going to happen. Uh, people are talking like NATO will definitely happen by this point. So a lot's going to happen in this five-year period. I mean, we've all seen the tents, right? The, so people definitely want the next five years to be very different from the last five years. But very recently, the Sustainable Development Goals were adopted. And those are going to be in place for 15 years. And those are going to have a massive effect on development work all around the world. And actually, every country has to pay attention to these. They've been adopted by the UN General Assembly. So it's a big deal, which means you can't just pay attention to five years. You need to be thinking 15 years ahead. So UN uh, here wrote a proposal and was given money by the uh, granting office in New York to do foresight. And so what are we literally trying to do? We're wedging foresight in here to try to understand these two futures. And we had these workshops, uh, two workshops, 40 participants. Uh, we had the youth workshop where the average age was 23. Uh, the thing I'm most proud of is we had 65% female, so we had a really nice gender balance. Um, we called them experts, but that's just because we didn't want to call them older people, uh, because the average age was 36, right? I mean, look, I'm closer here than I am here, so experts is fine. Uh, and we used a serious game, but we couldn't call it a serious game, and actually the same thing about the Ministry of Defense. Even though they do games, we had to call it an enhanced survey tool. Uh, that's a really nice way of saying serious game when you can't say serious game. So that's that's what we did. Uh, and the whole point is to create stats, but also to create stories and then focus on opportunities and values. And the thing I'm going to talk about that I'm really excited about is the online platform. So this is the first time that we've built an online version of the game and we are going to roll it out next week. So in these workshops, people had a chance to get together and to express what they thought were the values, opportunities, challenges, the stakeholders and actions that they thought were part of Montenegro's likely future and part of what they wanted their preferred future to be for Montenegro. And so uh, the first session was all about identifying those opportunities. But again, just because we're thinking about opportunities doesn't mean we want to ignore the challenges. And then at the end here, and this goes back to the whole point about the unthinkable, a large part of foresight is about creating these, what are sometimes called wild cards or jokers or emerging issues. Things that might seem unlikely, like jellyfish clogging a nuclear reactor, but can still happen and still have an impact. 
And so they played the game twice. The first time they played was likely future. The second time they played was preferred future. And then the next part for me is the really, uh, really interesting part. Tokens were assigned values. So the tokens have a particular weighting on them, which means we actually can create all sorts of interesting data models. So it's a serious game because it's meant to produce something on the back end. So what you're looking at here, let me say this right. This is all of the data outputs, or this is the data from the two workshops. And here is, I can't even read it. One of these is expert voices, one of these is youth voices, and there's a few better images here. So what do the colors represent? Each card is in a particular category. So for example, one of the opportunities we had was innovation, uh, was uh, let's say investment in education. A challenge would have been employment. A uh, challenge would have been, uh, pick something, right? An actor would have been a government ministry, but also citizens or youth. Values were things like uh, negative values, materialism, nepotism, but also positive things like sustainability and hard work. So we gave people the option to give their voice, but to play with these ideas. So for example, here, youth is seen as both an opportunity and as an actor. And there's some really interesting data about that as we go forward. Uh, the older group, or the experts, uh, we'll call them that, uh, saw infrastructure as an opportunity, but they also saw it as a challenge. And that was one of the huge differences between the two groups. Uh, the, I won't say older, the experts, I just did. The expert groups, right, were really concerned about infrastructure, and they also uh, mentioned hard work as well. Uh, we then categorized it, so we were able to look at the data according to a particular category, and just to, you know, Again, I don't speak Montenegrin, but because the data could be translated and we had translation team from the UN, uh, we have reports that are available in both English and in Montenegrin. So we're able then to model the data and try to make sense of it. The biggest opportunity that people thought was critical to Montenegro's future, uh, if we look at frequency, was employment. Um, now, what does red mean? Red thought that they would have a high impact, yellow was less of an impact, and green was a small impact. So what's interesting about using the tokens is they show you different layers of the data. So even though employment was given a higher overall weighting, was picked five times, knowledge access was picked four times, but the thickness of the lines indicate the overall impact, or let's say how much of a degree people thought it was critical. So actually, you can make an argument that knowledge access was more important than employment, but really, let's, again, uh, I think it shows a relationship between all of them because, again, a lot of reds come up with higher frequency. However, what is key to this model is it forces you to look at the data holistically. You can't just say, give me the top three, give me the top five. You look at everything because, from my perspective, education up here, volunteering here, social innovation, political changes are just as equally as important uh, if you know what you're looking for, right? If you're looking for the right kinds of things. And again, then we wanted to understand the opportunities, and we, this is the other category. So youth was seen as an opportunity. Uh, political changes, again, by expert voices, came up a few more times, but the thickness of the lines are actually pretty close, which means both youth voices and expert voices felt the same way about political changes being an opportunity. And that's a, that's a really open term. I mean, we weren't saying what kind of political changes. We wanted people to define them for themselves. We're then able to categorize cards by the year, and so what's interesting is that uh, there was a pretty equal perspective on seeing youth as an opportunity in the near-term future and in the long-term future. But technically, youth aren't youth anymore in the long-term future, which means they're actually talking about the younger generation. So that means overall there's a perspective in Montenegro based on the sample that we had that people think the next generation is the one that will carry the torch forward. Right? And that's not particular Montenegro. Most countries, most uh, civilizations that I know of think that. Uh, and that's the whole point, right? So for us, it was validating certain things and trying to understand them. Now, if we look, sort of uh, break down a little bit more, the experts, older group, uh, were more likely to give negative values in the near term future. So there is this old adage, right? The older you get, the sort of more jaded you get. And that seems to be the case. So when they were asked about values that they thought would have a likely impact in the next five years, they chose things that were negative, like nepotism, uh, like corruption, 
like uh, you know things that people thought were issues, right? So uh, again, it's an interesting way of validating data. And then this is so if you want the top twenty, this is the top twenty. So what were the main cards that were used? Youth, sustainability, employment, European Union, political changes, right? Uh, you don't get negative until you get a peer, nepotism, uh, non-discrimination. And so you can look at this and see the different categories of the cards. Uh, and then if you break it down, the same information, but look at it by year, you can start to see how people think about it and its impact over time. Again, that's a lot of information to throw at you. I highly recommend if you want to find out more of the report. It's only like 10 or 12 pages. Uh, most of that's pictures anyway. Uh, and you can look at all the data and understand it. And then we also have, you can download all the data as well. So if you want to play with it and make visualizations of the data, told, that makes my job so much easier. I um, totally love it if you did that. So what are we doing next? Well, we want to continue this conversation, but you can't get everybody to come to a workshop. It's just impossible. Uh, Montenegro, uh, certainly in the central and the south regions, has fantastic uh, internet penetration, right? Lots of people have access. So we thought, why don't we build an online platform and see if we can engage people uh, looking at these issues? Because there's another big meeting coming up with the government, and we want to get people's insights. We want to go beyond the 40 people in the room. But we want to continue the conversation. So a few years ago, there was a huge consultation that was done in the country. Uh, I think about, it about 14,000 people on the post-2015 development agenda, which is what just got validated by the UN, the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals. So we took that data and used it to make our game, which means we're connecting with, those, uh, you know, that, with that research. So what are we doing with this game? Well, we're taking the data from the workshops and we're making two computer players that are essentially algorithms based on the outputs from this from our workshops, which means we're trying to continue the conversation again. So this is actually designed as a single user experience, as a single player game. And I'd be really embarrassed if it doesn't work. So we're trying to launch it next week, uh, but I can show you the demo, hopefully, of uh, a little bit what it might look like. It will be in Montenegro. Uh, again, it's still being built. But this is the demo. That's the first time we've shown it. Okay. Deep breath. Okay. Seems to be sort of working. This is the tricky part. Okay. We know we need to translate it. Okay. That's good. Uh, so if you were to get a link to this, what would happen? Well, there would be a video. And I uh, will finish the video uh, this weekend. And the video will essentially be a minute or two, and it will give you a description of what you're supposed to do, right? But you can have the experience of uh, essentially giving your voice about Montenegro's future. And so uses the simple premise, right? You drag a card over, and but it says to you, okay, uh, what do you want to pick? Do you want to choose something, or do you want it into your own? So you could say, all right, I really don't think the options you've given me are, uh, I think, important. And if you're asking me about values, it really has to be this, right? Uh, as I learned in grade school, sharing is caring. So you can say, okay, sharing is important, and then you provide your information. Well, we all need hugs, so that's your answer. But you're not playing by yourself, right? You have these other two players, and those other two players are the voices from those two other workshops. Uh, and one of them is more focused on UN things, so the sustainable development goals, human rights agenda. The other is more focused on and the voices from those. And then you go through with the tokens again. Uh, you can see we're definitely not done yet, right? And you put a ranking on these cards. And then uh, you do it again and ask you these two questions. Uh, so we have complex layered data. And the whole idea is that helps us get more voices. And the results from this, and it goes on and on and on, uh, will be presented to the government. It's not another thing, but the point. Uh, and this is what we're doing. So. Uh, we really hope that when this goes live, uh, you'll play along and you'll share it. And we certainly hope that this is, geez, it's not water. It doesn't want water? Okay, good. All right. We can share, but because sharing is parent. Um, but we really like this to be an extension of the notion of citizen foresight. So if we can use this serious game to get more input, uh, then hopefully the outputs will be better. So thanks for listening. Uh, if you have any questions, I'd love to chat. Thanks so much. Chairs from the future.
Can we turn this thing off? Yeah, yeah, okay. sure thing. Good. Okay. Yeah, so it was perfect. Thanks, man. Okay. Uh, before we start the like more serious conversation, there was a conversation on Twitter asking mm. who has the best shoes tonight. And by far the best shoes for tonight go to John. Really? It's yeah. I mean Jumpman, right? Air Jordans? Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are the shoes I wanted as a kid, but I couldn't afford as a kid. So now I'm an adult. Yeah, that, that works perfect. I, yeah, now you're an expert. Right? Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. Oh yeah, thank you. Okay, so the only reason my brother was actually an expert was because he was <laughs> too old to be in the youngsters uh, group, right? No, no comment. No, he, no he's comment. not here right now. Oh, he's not, he's not watching here. He's not here. He is okay, watching, yes, he's so. definitely too old to be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's, that's the reason. So because he was bragging that he was invited by UN to be an expert on a workshop. So, so basically, he was too old. Okay, no, no uh, one story about the volcano in Iceland. Mm. So most of you were present at Spark Me conference this May and June. So uh, the closing keynote speaker of the conference was JB Kasarjian. So the, uh, Nicola and I met JB about 10, 11 years ago. And when we asked him what should we do in order to get him to Montenegro, he said, okay, just find me a good excuse and I will come. And then I started saying, look, but our budget is not he said no I, I didn't ask for many for money i just asked for a good excuse okay i'll find you a perfectly good excuse then so about six years afterwards we found a perfectly good excuse to get jb to speak in montenegro uh, and i made a like a really good five-day program for him to be in montenegro so both lecturing workshops um uh, workshops for ministry workshops for big companies uh free public lectures for students and like two days of leisure so everything was perfect everything worked out it was announced on all huge big media in montenegro so i go to, i talked to him on the phone and i said okay see you in the morning and i go to sleep and i was about to turn off my phone and something told me just don't do it and i said okay so i left my phone on and i was asleep and at one point of time the phone started ringing and I don't have a clue what time it is. And I pick up the phone and I'm like, hello. And you can see the old voice saying, Vladimir. And I'm like, <laughs> JB, is it you? And he said, the volcano. And I'm so <laughs> sleepy that I don't have a clue what the guy is saying. So I'm like, sorry, JB, what happened? And he was like, a volcano. And I said, okay, I'll call you in five minutes. So I go to the bathroom. And I take a shower and I return and I said, what, what was this guy saying about the volcano? I go online and there says a huge volcano eruption, yeah. all air traffic in yeah. Europe aborted. Yeah. And I'm like, okay, what, what do we do now? So when you said probably no one here except for <laughs> Maria in London had a problem, <clears throat> I'm like, okay, so that was probably the worst experience ever in event planning that we had. But then the guy who's like 80 years old, sit on like three different pro propeller planes. He was way back in Ukraine. So in three different like propeller airplanes, then like an eight hour road trip by a car. And then he got all the way to Bulgaria and then uh, got on a car with a professor from Zagreb driving to Belgrade. And then finally he managed to Belgrade so he arrived for like two and a half days to montenegro and i told him okay i'm gonna cancel all the business events and just leave leisure and he said no no take out the leisure reschedule all the business events and i'll do it and i'm like yes but even even nicola who's an expert can't <laughs> do it like three days of non-stop lecturing and you're like 80 years old and he was recovering from uh cancer surgery and he said, no, I'm going to do it. So he did everything and it was by far the best event we had up to the time. Okay, so the floor is yours now. You can ask about the game because it's a really big thing. So what is your role in the game? How 
will you be able to, to play? What do you need to play? Why on earth would you want to play a serious game? How can you help us, Maria, and the other UN system guys? Okay. Hi. I'm Philip Bolsic. I'm founder of uh, the NGO for Burdock here, here in Montenegro. That builds, uh, its main goal is uh, promotion, promotion of board games. Uh, so uh, it's a bit overwhelming for me to do this, this lecture. So uh, what was, uh, I was about to ask, uh, uh, one of our plans for the summer, uh, our future mm -hmm. is to make some of these games. Because our plan was to uh, propose to the government to have about the uh, uh, election process mm -hmm. and the sun, so on. But uh, it's, it's good to see that it's already done and mm -hmm. it, it could be done. Uh, my, my question is uh, can we help with this program? Always we are uh, here, we can do it. We have a lot of people that are experienced game, board game players and they like uh, our country and they want to, to be a part of it yeah. and uh, of course we have some uh, some words board, of advice for us right now in our in our NGO process <laughs> so the question was how can we help in development of the games yeah yeah, yeah. Well, I think the biggest part for me is, like I said, I'm a horrible game designer. Like I have friends that actually are game designers, right? So I, I already think, what am I gonna learn from you? And since you wanna do a game about Montenegro, you're the expert, right? Not me. So uh, I, I had this experience, actually, I did a game in Macedonia, I didn't talk about it, but the, we did a project with UNDP, and then uh, a, lo a local NGO wanted to take the game and to use it, right? And to mutate it and make it different. And they contacted me and they were like, should we do it? I'm like, yeah, of course, right? So I would love to do anything I can do to help this continue further as a tool for engagement. So whatever we can do, yeah, fantastic. Uh, and I think the UN would love that as well, to see this game continue to like have life and to continue, uh, precisely because I think the serious game space isn't doing enough now to be that political tool, right? To give people a voice and to feel empowered. So yeah, I would love to coordinate and see how we could take it further. And then again, I want to learn. So what I can learn from you guys to help make it better and to yeah do it again. Okay, we can make content and we can perfect, see perfect. That's great. Yeah, that, that would be awesome. <laughs> great. Yeah, thanks. Okay, guys. Hello. Okay. Yeah. Hi. Hi. My name is Andrus Panovic, and I wanted to ask you. You presented that you are going to have a, an online version of your game, right? Yep. yep. Is there possibly some print and play version or? Physical copy that should be. We yeah, you saw the pictures. We do have a physical uh, card game, right? Only five of them are in existence. Um, but I think that's something we haven't talked about that we should explore, right? Maybe like citizens could download it, run it themselves, and then share the results, right? Uh, so I think that would be really cool. Uh, and then again, we could also figure out so we're so the I oh man, he's not here, and I should have mentioned anyway the the designer of the game. Is a local local designer, Luca. Uh, Luca, oh, oh, yeah, yeah. So great. Uh, so he designed it, and it uses the national dress of Montenegro for the front side and the back side. Uh, it's just a little interesting trivia about the game. But yeah, I would love to see it available to people and to be used further. So I think that's something we definitely figure out uh, and figure out how to get you a copy. And you guys, it sounds like there's yeah, yeah. We just yeah, we just we sure. Will. Let's do it. Together, so. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. I think that I mean at least at least my my sense is the more we can see it live on and grow and be different. So if a year or two from now, if it's completely different, but if it's better, that's fantastic, right? So how do we make it better? And how do we make it uh, get it in people's hands? So yeah. All right, let's definitely talk. Yeah. So we'll, so oh, sorry. Yeah. So gaming and chill is the new Netflix and chill, right? Because <laughs> <All> right. Okay. <laughs> right, right, right. Uh, how can we get the URL with the raw data from the games for the analysis or data visualization? Uh, it's in the you report. The URL or... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll, I'll tweet. I'll tweet it and I'll CC uh, you guys on okay. there. Just use the hashtag digitalism. Yeah, 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 right yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And uh, so there's a link in the report, and right now I think it's 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 just like on my Dropbox. You can download all of the data from the workshops. Um, we'll, once we get the data from the online platform, we'll make that available as well. So we definitely want to do the open data thing and, and have that available for everybody. Yeah. yeah. There's a new hackathon. In yeah, 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 right. <laughs> right. 
I, so the program I'm using for the social network analysis is uh, open source, Cytoscape. And again, I learned how to use it in a weekend because I had to. The person who was supposed to do it flaked out. Uh, so that's like basic stuff. That's like baby stuff. So there are way better visuals that could be made. Uh, it'd be really cool if people wanted to play with it. Yeah, yeah. awesome. Yeah. More questions, guys? So when do you expect the online version of the game for Montenegro to be up? Oh, it's we the won't hold you for your easiest word, but and the hardest question. Yeah. Uh, the real answer was two days ago, but the, <laughs> uh, we, as you as you can so see, the next future is as you can see, like we are doing just the last tweaks to it right now. So the tr final translation stuff is getting put up, but the, the gameplay works, right? So the dynamics are there. Uh, my hope is no later than the, the middle of next week, but okay. Tuesday, Wednesday at the latest, we would do our rollout. Now, if you follow these guys online, if you're connected to the Facebook communities, chances are you won't be able to ignore it. I, I think there's going to be a pretty big social media outreach to try to get people using it. We'll be it. flooding all social yeah, media outlets, yeah, don't worry. Yeah. And then tell us what, what you like, what you didn't like. I mean, we want feedback, right? Hopefully, it'll get made again and get made better. Now, this game that we've designed is a single user experience, right? So you do it by yourself online. The computer plays with you. Uh, hopefully, at some point, we could actually design a multi-user experience, right? So you could log in with your friends and play. And maybe you could play, maybe it could be asynchronous. You don't all have to be online at the same time. You can play at different times, right? Or you could get in a room and pass around an iPad and play, right? So uh, I hope is if this goes well, that there will be continued versions of it and it can mutate. And we're using local developers as well. So we want it to be... Is there a winner in this game? Yes, Montenegro is the winner. <laughs> yeah, is the winner in this game. Um, so in this particular game, the win condition is secondary because, again, we want the data, right? Um, when we tried to make a, a very clear win condition in this game, it just felt really forced. So that's why that is an enhanced survey tool, right, and not a game. Uh, because, yeah, we couldn't, we couldn't feel like we had a game that worked precisely because it just, it just felt too forced, yeah? Uh, and all the cards here get two tokens. So the other games you saw, sometimes a card has eight tokens and some card, sometimes a card has one token. So everyone's a winner in this game. No, it's not bad. It's like Angry Birds, right? Even if it well, goes bad, it still does well. So um, what I'm, I'm, what's interesting to me is actually strategic planning. Mm -hmm. And uh, data gotten by this kind of survey, mm -hmm. how much more accurate or better is it yep. like doing it like this than classical service? Yep. Uh, I get asked that question all the time. And obviously, uh, two workshops of 40 people is not a statistically significant sample, right? Uh, but my argument is always, well, how well has the scientific standards been? In other words, has that produced results that we've been happy with? And I think a lot of people will say, maybe not, right? So my idea is to disrupt that, that model. Um, do I think that actually there's something to be said for using a sample and setting your variables? Yeah, I, I definitely think that's useful. Um, but we are qualitative. And actually, a lot of people get upset, and I have colleagues that are sociologists that do SPSS and everything, and they're like, I don't know what you're doing, because you're doing qualitative, but then you're producing quantitative, but then your an analysis is qualitative. And I said, yeah, that's exactly what we're doing. Uh, and I think because of the complexity of what we're trying to get from people, having the stories and the stats together makes a lot of sense. So when we show the stats, it's because some people in the room want to see the number and see the data and show me how thick the line is, right? And then someone else in the room sitting next to them might say, give me the story that they said. So we're actually just trying to get whatever we can get to help convince the decision maker or the planner to hopefully have a bit more insight and to do it that way. Um, I think as time goes on, I, I hope I'll get better at being attentive to those issues. And I think actually that's one of the key questions about serious games and, and research in general on serious games is how valid are the results? And what does valid even mean if you're asking people to play a game anyway, right? So uh, th there's academic journals on this stuff, right? Uh, and we, we just wrote an article actually on the European Commission game, and we've submitted it to a journal in a conference, uh, a conference actually. Um, it's the Game Alliance Conference uh, in Rome in December. And so we're gonna present our results, and we're a little bit scared because that's like the <laughs> hardcore gaming community. And we're gonna kind of roll in and be like, hey, 
we made a game, and I don't know what they're going to say to us. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see. And but those are the issues that yeah we're definitely dealing with. So that was kind of a non-answer, but yeah, oh, yeah, okay. Okay, so once the game is up, it will be up for how long? The well, Montenegro version. The Montenegro version. We uh, and once it's up, uh, we are trying to work out how long. We're talking at least two weeks, maybe three weeks. Uh, there's an event in the third week of October that we want to have data for. So when it goes live, you'll you won't be able to ignore it, right? Uh, you'll hear all about it, and we want people to play, right? And then, as you know, like with online engagements, it'll it'll go down for a little bit. Less people will use it, and then we want to do another push. Again. Yeah, yeah. And right now, uh, there's a login page you didn't see, but we're, we don't want you to feel like you can only do it once, right? Because as the whole four examples of the future, right? If you wake up the next day or if something changes and you feel differently about the future, that's fine. Uh, we are going to ask for demographic data. So we want age, we want gender. We're going to ask for geographies. We want to know uh, what municipality you live in. Uh, I think there's a bit about education. Uh, yeah. Email, email, enter, entering your email is optional, uh, and it's anonymous. So if you just want to rail on the future because you think it's horrible and you're feeling like a roller coaster one day, that's great. If you wake up and you're sailing on the sea the next day, perfect. Uh, so we really want you to feel like you can give a voice and then give feedback to us so we can make it better. Uh, and again, it's available primarily in Montenegrin, but then there's uh, you can switch back and forth. There's English and Montenegrin as well. Okay, awesome. Okay, that concludes our event for tonight. It's been an hour and a half. I told you it's going to be an hour and a half. You nailed it perfectly. Yeah. Foresight. Yeah. 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 yeah, good job. <laughs> the expert. <laughs> yeah, the expert. <laughs> so thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you, guys, watching the live stream. Thank you. The... Okay, <laughs> smile for the camera. There might be a person in there. I don't know. Yeah, yeah. there's another yeah. camera there, totally. but middle things probably yeah. mixing it up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good night. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to our dear friends from Trebjesa. They're going to do a, another retweet of your tweet probably tomorrow. Then I should probably have one of their beers later. Yeah, yeah. Okay. We're up. Seems fair. So, yeah. thanks. Uh, this has been the first event of the fifth season of Digitalism with Talks. We're going to have another one, maybe another one even in October, but in November for sure. So, thanks everyone, and it's been a blast. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat>